everyone. Welcome to our Wednesday webinar. My name is Anita Parker, and I'm one of the educational developers here at the Center for Teaching and Learning. And the title of today's presentation is Supporting Relatedness in an Online Course. Uh, I'll speak for about 10 minutes, and then I will, I will stop sharing my screen and we'll We'll open up the floor for Q&A. For those of you who are new to our Wednesday webinars, we do the one-way presentation so that it can become a video that then goes on our website. And then magic really happens in the QA and sharing in the time afterwards. That's where you get to uh, unmute, show your camera if you want, and uh, and, and we, we share anecdotes and questions with each other. And, and it's a, a really uh, neat, neat time. Uh, so we'll see what happens today with with that. Um, I wrote a bit of an article on I wrote an article on this topic and then I used the article to create my speaking notes. So that bitly there, uh, you don't have to type it in now, but if uh, it'll now be part of the video. So when you watch the video, you'll be able to access uh, my article that I put together. And then in the article, there's a the thorough reference uh, list and things like that. So so that's just a resource for you um, if you are interested. All right, so relatedness, here's the definition of relatedness. It is a sense of belonging and connectedness with others. Of course, it's important in any aspect of our lives, but it's especially important in education because learning is a social phenomenon. According to social learning theorists, we learn by observing, internalizing, and reacting to those around us and what happens around us. So of course you can learn in isolation, you can memorize, facts and answer as many multiple choice questions that you like. But for true learning, learning from peers, things like co-creating knowledge, solving problems, uh, figuring out real life situations, honing um, essential skills like communication, collaboration, problem solving, ethics, things like that, you really need to um, work with uh, others and have that relatedness with others. This is the theory of self-determination. This might look familiar from September and October when we were together, if you joined us. According to this theory of self-determination, um, his students, everyone have three basic psychological needs. Autonomy is a sense of responsibility and choice in our personal circumstances. Competence is a sense of mastery around things that are important to us. And the one on the right, the relatedness is where we are today is again, that sense of uh, belonging and connectedness with others. For students, when these three needs are met, intrinsic motivation, um, engagement, and self-directedness are the result. And so in September, we talked about autonomy in an online course, uh, competence in an online course, and today's topic is relatedness in an online course. And I created this three-part series for you because this connection, it it creates somewhat of a framework or even a, a checklist for when you're designing or developing your activities and you're, you're working on your teaching strategies in your online um, course. So I'm hoping that by the end of these three, you have some useful tangible uh, strategies. Students' sense of relatedness, it's valuable in any course, but especially uh, online, because you are separated uh, geographically, you are separated often by time if you don't have a synchronous component. And increased feelings of social isolation can be a result of that, uh, that separation. So really important in an online course. In an online course, there's three types of interaction. We're not going to talk about the yellow one today, that student and content interaction. We're talking about the green and the black, student to student and student to instructor, or the, the black one is more re is relating to the rapport that you, uh, that you build with students. And we'll go through these um, one at a time. Um, instructors are busy. You're busy with all the aspects of teaching, learning outcomes, planning lessons, assessments, grade books, showing up to class on time, all of those day-to-day -day things. That relatedness is often overlooked. It's an extra thing that you just often don't have time for. And bottom line, 
for student-student interactions, you just get them talking to each other. So uh, how do you get them doing that? What kinds of things can you get them talking to each other about? And when you do plan these activities, the more well-planned, the more clear your instructions are, the better they're going to go on the, on the fly. And then you can also take into account that because this is a sharing, there's a certain level of vulnerability, vulnerability perhaps. And, and then you can have a, perhaps if needed some uh, flexibility on the level of, of engagement that students are required um, in their relatedness aspect of these um, activities and how comfortable they are in participating. So, of course, in a synchronous session, when you're together with students in a web conferencing situation, students can unmute and speak to the whole group. Of course, that depends on how big your class is. Students can type things in the chat and you can have this back channel conversation uh, going, no, uh, going on. It's kind of like passing notes when, when we were in school, but now it's an acceptable and a really rich part of learning is that back channel chat. And of course, you can put students into breakout rooms so they can work in smaller groups that way. Um, asynchronously, there's a number of ways to have students talking to each other in discussion forums, in collaborative uh, documents like wikis or Google Docs, Google Slides, Jamboards, um, all kinds of places where they add uh, uh, social annotation tools. That's the shared reading that I have on the, the screen there. Um, students can also meet on their own time. They can meet by video conferencing, or they can also meet um, in person if they're working on a project, or maybe they're just meeting to, to study together. And another aspect to, to the student-student inter interactions, you can set up an activity, but you can't just let it go and simmer. Uh, you, you as the instructor are there to make sure that all contributions are welcomed and, uh, and encouraged there. Student to student interactions. Let's have a, a, a list of specific ideas, not so specific that I'll give you like, here's how you do this, but just some ways to get students talking. Icebreakers, in-class tasks, that's your problem solving, discussing a case, role playing, whatever is getting them turning to their neighbor or moving their, um, not turning to their neighbor, this would be more breakout rooms, but but. It, moving to their breakout rooms to to discuss things. Um, note taking pairs. Students um, can work in collaborative documents to take pairs, to take notes in pairs, maybe groups of three. Students spend a lot of um, uh, time making sure their notes are good so then they go home and they work with them later. And if you have two or three working in the same document, then uh, there's less chance of anything being missed. Social annotation, that's what you're seeing on the right. It's a document and you can see that the students are having a conversation in the margin. They're highlighting, starring, circling, underlying things, underlining um, things. Uh, good old group projects, maybe small ones along the way or those larger projects where there's a, a high stakes deliverable at the end. Uh, reciprocal peer, peer teaching. Students learn something and they teach each other about what they have learned. And that's called a jigsaw strategy. Well, the one of them is called a jigsaw strategy. And I think we have a webinar uh, on, on that, on ways that students can learn from each other. Uh, how about they don't actually do their quiz or even their assessments together uh, in groups? This, this is often done as a, as a two-stage quiz or a two-stage exam where they actually get to discuss about, well, what's the answer, A, B, or C? Why do you, why do you think that's the answer? Uh, and, and then, of course, the informal study uh, group. So lots and lots of ways that students in an online, any course, but an online course can talk to each other. That's the student-student interactions. How about student-instructor relatedness? And what you're seeing here is a word cloud of lots of ways that an instructor builds a positive rapport with students. Uh, an instructor is approachable, caring, concerned, considerate, encouraging, fair, friendly. I put them in alphabetical order in my list. Helpful, reliable, respectful, trust, thoughtful, trustworthy. There's, phew, there's, there's a lot of them there, and it might feel uh, overwhelming. 
thing. We we wish as instructors we could be all things to all people all the time, and we do our best, and maybe we're not quite as successful as we want to be, but you can really see that there are things that you can do, characteristics that you can that you can portray to build a rapport. Uh, it's important because for students, when they perceive that they have a good rapport with their instructor, it's a determinant. It, it impacts their commitment and therefore potentially their success in a course. So it does matter for students. For instructors, uh, building rapport for you can provide you with a sense of accomplishment can help you prevent emotional exhaustion and can provide you with some uh, more positive uh, evaluations of teaching. It is worth your while to, to uh, work on your rapport building with, uh, with students. How can you do that? Despite the absence of a physical classroom space, your words and your actions matter. You let students know from day one to four months later that you truly do have their best interest at, uh, at heart. There's lots of educational technology for you to do this. You can, your words and actions come through e-class, through Zoom, through your email for, for the, when you're, uh, and then even just speaking with, with students um, in whatever, whatever format. And then the actual elements in your LMS and in your course, your syllabus, do you make use of the announcements forum? Are you generous with your office hours? And even if you do have a strong synchronous component to your online course, you can still build students some pre-recorded videos, a hello video at the start of the course, maybe a little hello to each module or talk about a certain assignment, um, et cetera. You can build rapport in a synchronous session, but you can also build rapport in an asynchronous session as uh, as well. Uh, let's look at synchronous. What can you do in a synchronous environment? Here's again, kind of a checklist of, of some things you might be like, oh, I know that. And oh, well, I guess that is kind of important. Um, arrive early. Start on time and do your best to say hello and greet students as they come in, just like you would be standing outside your physical classroom. Can you show up in the virtual space and be there, be available to, uh, to students as they arrive? Learning students' names and, and using them when you can. Obviously, that's much easier done in a small class than in a large class, but we, we do our best under all our, all our circumstances. The more you get to know your students, they're interest, then you can bring those into your examples, into the problems or the cases or the, the examples that you provide uh, for whatever the topic is that you that you have in your course content. Have an upbeat, dynamic presence within your own style, of course. You absolutely can't be someone that you're not, but the energy in your voice, the energy in your posture, even on uh, Zoom matters. You want to use your, your uh, nonverbal um, communication as much as, as, as Zoom, your Zoom box will allow you to. Of course, you want to welcome student contributions in those whole class uh, discussions. Um, and I have a couple more here for you. Um, when you do put them into breakout rooms, um, just as you would in a physical classroom roaming around and having one ear here for one group, one ear there for another group, looking for any teachable moments or clarification that you need to provide, you can still roam your breakout rooms and do that, uh, that same um, thing. Um, oops, oh, that's two. There you go. There's one. How about an appropriate professional level of self-disclosure? Humanize yourself. Let students know that you're a real person. You, of course, you know, you have to share what you're comfortable in sharing, but uh, this is really a really important aspect of building rapport as well. And then my last point there is uh, make sure you finish on time. You've got somewhere to go. Students have somewhere to go and, and they'll appreciate you uh, finishing the class um, on time. That's the synchronous stuff. How about asynchronously? Be generous with your office hours. Align them with the, to the best you can with times that students are available. 
Uh, smaller classes, can you have one-on-one -on -one check ins with students? And this could align with, with an actual assignment where students can come and talk to you about a certain um, topic idea that they have for a research paper or some kind of, of project that they might be working on. Mark your assignments in a timely manner and provide feedback that's timely and meaningful and relevant to where they're at in the course. Uh, I mentioned this earlier, a little hello video at the beginning of the class, even though you, you're going to be seeing them in real time. I'm in Zoom if you have a synchronous component, still a self-introduction video with that appropriate level of self-disclosure. Why, why, why did you choose your area of expertise? What's going on with your research? How do you prefer that students address you? Why do you like teaching your course? And is there any other fun facts that you would like to share? And then maximize E-class, that announcements forum, um, uh, the, the, uh, all the artifacts that you can put into E-class for communication will really, any communication that you um, have with students with, contributes to the rapport that you build with them. So that is a lot for relatedness in an online course. I will click four times. I got four images for you to summarize. Relatedness is part of the self-determination theory. It's important to consider when you're planning and building and delivering your online course. You have students, student interactions to consider, get them talking to each other, the student instructor interactions. That's your rapport with students. Those are the aspects you want to consider when you're looking at your teaching strategies and materials. Um, and for, oh, the, here's the third picture. For students, you get them talking to each other. And for the student to instructor, that's your rapport building.